We released Titanic 20 years ago. It seems like a lifetime. But I remember everything like it was yesterday, from the first dive to the wreck to our last day of production. We were creating a living history, so I needed every detail as accurate as we could make it. We owed the truth to the hundreds of souls lost that night in 1912. Even now, I feel a responsibility to the living and the dead. Did we get it right? After decades of exploration and scientific analysis, we know a lot more than we did when we made the film. So I've gathered a team of experts, Park Stevenson, Ken Marshall, and Don Lynch, to reopen the case file on Titanic and look at what we've discovered over the last 20 years. We'll investigate whether more lifeboats on board could have saved more lives. I think I probably would cut faster if my life depended on it. Hear the surprising story of how the long lost ship was found. Did you get spooked? It was spooky. And learn how the film affected the families of some of Titanic's famous passengers. Molly Brown. She sounded like a real pistol. I would have loved to have met her. She was larger than life. We'll step back in time to see how our sets match up against what we found at the wreck site. And we'll mount tests that may answer questions about the sinking that have bothered me for almost two decades. Yes! We'll see where we were right and where we got it wrong. When we made Titanic, we tried to do a film that was as if we had gone back in a time machine to that night. We tried to be as accurate as it was humanly possible to be. You could walk out of Rose's cabin, down the corridor, down the grand staircase, through the reception room, and into the dining room. It was every photograph I had ever seen. It was perfect. And action that feeling that you had, no longer was Titanic just a story in a book or a picture. You were there. James not only made this movie, he embraced the subject. And the, the success of the movie made it possible to deploy new technologies to explore the wreck in ways that had never been done before. Who would have thought that stuff would still be there? It's a dream come true for me. To me, it just opened the door to so many mysteries and unanswered questions. And then that snowballed into a real lasting interest in the forensic work, the kind of marine archaeology of the wreck site, and a lasting interest in the history of Titanic and the impact that it had on society. The wreck is the last surviving witness to the disaster. It still has stories to tell for anybody willing to pay attention and listen to what the wreck has to tell us. Are you ready to go back to Titanic? On April 14th, 1912, at 11.40 p.m., the RMS Titanic struck an iceberg during its maiden voyage from Southampton, England, to New York City. Two hours and 40 minutes later, it sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Of the more than 2,200 passengers and crew on board, just over 700 survived that night. The wreck remained lost at sea until 1985, when oceanographer Robert Ballard discovered it while on a secret mission for the US Navy. His expedition changed the way we explore the deep, and it changed my life. Bob and I recently met at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library to take a look at their exhibit on Titanic. This is the story I could never tell. Bob Ballard is one of the nation's top oceanographers, but of course what he's best known for is discovering the Titanic. And that's an amazing story because it turns out that that was just a cover story for a mission that he was doing for the U.S. Navy at the time. In the 1960s, the U.S. Navy lost two nuclear submarines, the Thresher and the Scorpion, under mysterious circumstances. In the 1980s, Dr. Robert Ballard was brought in to explore the wreck sites and find out if the Soviet Union had gotten there first. My mission was to go out to both the Thresher and the Scorpion and completely document 100% of the wreckage. As it turns out, Ballard found the missing subs and completed his mission so quickly that he still had 12 days left to search for Titanic. It was actually mapping the wreckage that told me how to find the Titanic. When the Thresher and the Scorpion imploded, all these pieces came falling down to the ocean floor. And so as it was falling down, the currents carried it. 
for over a mile. It was a comet of debris. So instead of looking for a Titanic, I looked for its debris. When the Carpathia got the distress call, it was down here, yeah. headed to the reported position. Yeah, ran into them early. Ahead of schedule. Yeah. So I said, what's the air celestial navigation back of five miles? So I said, yeah. let's go another five. It has to be to the north. Yeah, right. So then you just run straight north. But so I, then I run east-west lines across, across, the, intersect, across the, yeah. the intersect, but space them yeah. 0.9 miles. Yeah. And if I don't get it, interspace them at half. You already knew that at that depth, the debris field would be Roughly more than a mile. mile. Yeah, so yeah, I yeah. cheated a little. I said, yeah. let's do 0.9. Yeah. That's pretty smart. And then if I don't get it, I'll just interlace. Yeah, right. So we began running lines back and forth. And on the ninth line, yeah. hit the debris. You well didn't known. Know, you didn't know it was Titanic no, stuff until we, you saw the boiler. Correct. Wreckage. Bingo. Yeah. Somebody had to go get Bob. For some reason, and I, I just wasn't sleepy. And the knock on the door, this is now a, a two in the morning. And the cook stuck his head in. And he said, the guys think you might. And he didn't even finish the sentence. And I was past him. And I got into the command center. And just as I entered the command center, they went over the boiler. <laughs> knew it wasn't any wreck, it was the Titanic. And it was like scoring the winning goal at the buzzer. So our reaction was jubilant, jumping up and down, celebrating. And then someone said, she sinks in 20 minutes. And that innocent comment was devastating, because what were we doing celebrating anything? We were embarrassed that we were dancing on someone's grave. So I just said, stop the ship, I'm going outside. We went out on the fantail and we had a private memorial and that was it. Everybody that dives Titanic has their own story of seeing it for the first time. And yeah. probably the most frequently asked question to me is what was it like seeing the wreck for the first time? I get time? asked, yeah, what was and it like? And I always want to tell them the story they want to hear, right. which was there she was in you know yeah. this beautiful, stately ruin yeah, right, 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 coming right. out of the dark. Oh, That's not right. what happened. <laughs> no. Oh, like I remember cliff. when we, this was where we came in. We landed here. And it's a cliff. The, you know, the wall of China. I mean, yeah. it's just a wall. And, and the first thing I recognized was the anti-fouling paint. Yeah, the red, pink. the red paint. It was right? still pink, and I said, too bad they didn't paint the whole ship yeah. with that stuff. And the bilge keel is sitting was, up on top exactly. of the sand. Exactly, it was back, right, back here, yeah. right there. Yeah. And then the pilots, he said, we got to go. Yeah. So he dropped his weights, and then we began our ascent. But then these eyes. Yeah, which is your lights kicking back. Your lights, you, all the eyes of the type, like the people in, were looking at us. Did you get spooked? It was spooky, because yeah. we were now in free ascent. Yeah. There was no, you couldn't stop. You dropped all your weights. Yeah. And it was just all these eyes, and then we cleared it. It was amazing. <laughs> That's pretty much what it looked like to me the first time, except we were down here someplace, and we came in on her right about here. Yeah. And we had come across this bermed up mud. Yeah, yeah. He came up. And we just cleared here, yeah, right. and then we wound up sitting up here. Yeah. But there's also nothing cooler than coming up on her from the from yeah. The, from yeah, the, that was our second time. That's the money shot. And that's right? the money shot right. looking up. We did it for fake in the movie, and it's, never it's the transition shot where it goes into 1912. Yeah. Yeah. So we come past, past old Rose's face, yeah. we come to that shot of the stem, the vertical yeah, right. bow, and then we, we transition into 1912, and we crane right, up over right. it, and we see the whole ship. You won't find bodies at Titanic. Uh, you won't find skeletons. The bones actually dissolve into solution very rapidly at that depth. What anybody who's explored the wreck finds is pairs of shoes. It takes years for a skeleton to vanish, but the shoes treated with tannic acid, they won't eat them. So all around the Titanic are the shoes. There's a scene where we were filming and we came across a pair of women's shoes yeah. next to a pair of girls' shoes. These were people. These were people. Those shoes got but to those, the bottom 
doubled up on people. They were in their cabin. Yeah. Because the cabin was all around the destruction of it. And there was a hand mirror yeah. next to them. Yeah. And a comb. Yeah. And then a bone comb. So I could imagine her holding the mirror as her mother combed yeah. her hair yeah. and then put the bone you comb create in. A whole, create a whole story. This is the human element. This is what people touched. It's what they lived with. Amazing. Pretty daunting when you see all the names all at once. I exactly. Know. I mean, how many people? In this, 1,496 people. Yeah. You know, imagine all of these people out there in the ocean. This is the crowd that was floating at sea. You yeah. know, you, you get so into the forensics of yeah. it, yeah. you know, and the studying the wreck and the breakup of the wreck and discovering the artifacts and so on, you really lose sight of the human tragedy. Sometimes. I know, I know that that was an epiphany for me when I was there at the wreck the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, how that hit me. And I'd been studying it for months, yeah. you know, but it wasn't, now it wasn't out of remove. It wasn't a myth anymore. These were real people. Yeah. Everybody yeah. had a family somewhere that's probably yeah. affected to this day. Hi, Paul. Paul is the great grandson of Isidore and Ida Strauss. I know their story well. I wanted to meet with the families of Titanic victims and survivors, to hear their stories and learn how they felt about how I depicted their ancestors. I started with Paul Kurzman. His great-grandfather, Isidore Strauss, was a self-made millionaire and a former congressman. He and his wife, Ida, chose to die together on the Titanic. The story, as you know so well, is that she got into a lifeboat, women and children did, and expected her husband is a door to follow. To come in, yeah. And he said, I will not enter a lifeboat until I see that all the women and children on board are in lifeboats. And she you said, No! We've been together for 40 years. And where you go, I go. Don't argue with me, Isidore. You know it does no good. We will be on the ship together as it goes down. We will die as we have lived together. When they found Isidore's body, they found a locket with the initials Isidore Strauss. Here is a picture of their eldest son, mm -hmm. Jesse. Mm -hmm. And here is a picture of their eldest daughter, Your Sarah. Grandmother. My grandmother. Your grandmother. <laughs> so that's what he that's what he kept close to his heart. And this is the most precious item in my life. Right. That's powerful. It's powerful. When the end of the film came, I didn't want to move. I didn't want to leave the theater. Well, thanks. I was captured. It was really the accuracy, the work that you did as director toward ensuring authenticity. It wasn't of just the me, film. though. It wasn't just me, because once we had dived to the wreck, everybody who came aboard, production designer, costume designer, everyone felt that we had to live up to that standard. 20 years ago, we tried to bring Titanic to life without compromise. We did the best we could with the information we had. But since then, I've made 33 dives to the wreck site, and I've discovered surprising new things about the ship and solved mysteries that have puzzled explorers for decades. For the movie Titanic, we unearthed every known photograph, poured over architectural drawings, and built our ship rivet by rivet, making sure everything was in its rightful place, as was known back in 1996. Today, at the Reagan Library exhibit, we'll look back at some of our film sets armed with ROV footage from my 33 dives to the wreck to see what we got right and what we didn't. <laughs> it's quite proper, I assure you. This is the sitting room. Wow, so they've completely rebuilt the set. You know, I haven't seen this since we made the film 20 Isn't this years ago. Isn't great? It's great, yeah. This was like one of our first couple days of shooting. And one of the very first things that Kate Winslet and Leonardo had to do was, you know, get naked. <laughs> we were inspired by this Regency motif that mm -hmm. was known to be on Olympic and known to be on Titanic in other rooms. And we placed it into the portside millionaire suite, the three-room yes. suite, because yes. nobody knew what was in we there. We didn't know that at we, the time. I was working in what was not known. The crazy thing about all this 
is we made the movie in 96, and in 2005, we got into yeah. the Strauss suite on B deck, and it looked just like the fake set. That the we most had excited I've ever seen you. Oh man, that, that was <laughs> like I was geeking out. Oh, oh there, say it's not the clock. It's, it looks like a say clock. Say it to is me. not the clock on the mantle. Oh it's, my God! And look at the the this woodwork. Is outrageous! It was just sitting there. It was, it was utterly surreal. It was like a little bubble of yeah. perfect preservation. Oh, it's unbelievable. If you wrote a screenplay with that, it's almost, you know, like yeah. pushing it. Yeah, sure, the clock's gonna still be sitting on the mantle. It was. Of course, it was <laughs> attached for heavy seas in the North Atlantic, but that, it, that nothing hit it, that no furniture floating around the room. Took it out or dirty, broke the yeah, glass. Exactly. And that clock holds an important forensic clue. That clock has the time that this cabin flooded. Right. And we know the times on the chronometer on the bridge. So if we can get the time off that clock and match it to the time on the bridge chronometer, we have the rate of Titanic sinking. You're telling me I got to go back down there? Well, it, 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 there's some muck on that thing. We need to clean it off and see yeah. what it says. CQD, sir? That's right, CQD, the distress call. That's our position. When we shot the film in 96, this yeah. was based on the best information we had. Mm -hmm. Right. There was one kind of funky double exposed picture. Mm -hmm. Of Titanic. Of, yeah, mm -hmm. and it showed kind of this area, as I right. recall. Right, yeah. and this is not see in the that. photo. You didn't see any of that. We assumed it was there. Because it, the Olympic mm -hmm. photos showed the, yeah. it. Yeah, so this was actually a pretty good reproduction of Olympic. And it turned out to be completely wrong for Titanic once we got in there with the ROV. So we kind of got this part right, and we got this part completely wrong, because this is all actually in a separate room, a silent room, right? The thing is, these guys were heroes. I didn't have time to get it into the film, but the wireless operators were like the hackers of their day. The actions taken by operators Bride and Phillips saved hundreds of lives. They lost power on the set the day before the disaster. The Marconi maintenance manual says in this situation, you leave it alone, wait for a Marconi engineer ashore to fix yeah, it, yeah. and you're gonna operate off this emergency coil here. Yeah, so which is battery powered. Yeah, which had Zippo powered. for range. About 60, 70 miles theoretical yeah, range, yeah. which Carpathia was a little bit outside that range yeah, when she yeah. started to pick up Titanic's distress calls. Right, and go in the other direction. So. If they hadn't rebuilt the set, they wouldn't have been able to talk to Carpathia. Probably Carpathia not. Carpathia saved over 700 people. The point is, they wouldn't have been saved if these guys hadn't disobeyed the rules. So you wanna go to a real party? So this is the grand staircase, which we built it from the plans, the way they actually built the staircase. So the staircase has got a steel footing. Then when we sank the ship, it lifted. Wood is buoyant. It ripped off that footing and it all floated up. And it actually pinned two stunt players. Fortunately, they weren't hurt, but it was a pretty scary moment. When the wreck was first found, there was no staircase. And the assumption was made that the little wood boring mollusks had eaten the whole thing. But then we couldn't figure out why all the columns and wall paneling and everything on the D-deck level and so on were still there. And, and this Didn't is so up. substantial. I mean, this is solid oak. Oak is yeah. one of the strongest, densest woods. Yeah. And even if the wood had disappeared, where did all those iron balustrades go? Yeah, exactly. So we, we yeah. went down and we looked around the bottom with the ROV. We couldn't even find remnants. No. We couldn't find remnants of the balustrades. We couldn't find remnants of the stairs or any of that stuff. So we thought, ah, it floated out. It was an interesting, you know, kind of art imitating life. Yeah. Where exactly? If we hadn't made the movie, we wouldn't have come to that answer. I don't think. Wandering through the Titanic exhibit, it's hard not to feel haunted by the relics of the past: a deck chair, a gold pocket watch, a traveling coat. You feel the lost souls standing there beside you, and I felt that way making the movie as well. Is this Jim Cameron? This it's a pleasure to be here. Her nice. grandparents uh, were John Jacob Astor and sure, Madeline. Sure, of course, yeah. In the case of John Jacob Astor and Madeline, I mean, here was the richest man on the Titanic with his brand new wife and starting a new family and everything. 
Jackie had a strong personality and I saw kind of a through line in that spark of life that I imagine J.J. Astor had. Thank you for joining us here. Your father, I believe, was in, yes, in Madeline months. Astor's abdomen at that point. She was five months pregnant. His little wifey there, Madeline, is my age and in a delicate condition. See how she's trying to hide it? He seemed like a really interesting man. He's an absolutely fascinating man. And he was more praised for dying <laughs> as a hero rather than the life that he actually led, which was quite amazing. He had a curious mind. We shot a couple scenes around their story that got cut out of the movie. But I was fascinated by the moment where he was cutting open the life preserver and seeing the cork and figuring out how the life preserver worked. But this is what Madeline wore. It looks tiny. Yeah, well, this is this this life jacket kept her warm and maybe maybe kept her alive. My father went to Halifax and he was offered that and he said, he just couldn't even talk about it. Mm. He couldn't even think about Too it. Too traumatic. They changed his life, and uh -huh. I think his mother was totally traumatized. Yeah. Do you, by any chance, know how my grandfather died, and if the lifeboat number four that my grandmother was in was close enough to have seen Have it? seen it? I don't think they would have seen it. Because he died with the funnel it's, collapsing. It's thought because of the soot on his body. Your vision of the faces in the water gave just the most mm. amazing, mm. chilling feeling. I think one of my realizations after the film was released is that, you know, this isn't ancient history. This isn't 200 years ago. In trying to sell viscerally how traumatic it must have been for the survivors, including going back into that field of bodies, trying to find somebody still alive, you know, I probably wasn't as sensitive to how that might have felt to people whose families had been traumatized by the event. I'd never thought about it before. Yeah, and yeah. I saw it, and it really hit me. The film Titanic depicted what we believed was an accurate portrayal of the ship's last hours. We showed it sinking bow first, lifting the stern high in the air before its massive weight broke the vessel in two. Over the past 20 years, I've been trying to figure out if we got that right. I've dived to the wreck dozens of times, and I brought in naval engineers to analyze all the complex variables at work. Now, I want to take it to the next level, doing an actual real-world physical test of the sinking that incorporates the new information we've gathered. Will it sink the way we portrayed it? I don't know. Our mission is to mirror the physics at work as best we can and see what happens. There's a gazillion theories floating around. There always have been. We want to come up with a credible theory. The whole purpose of this investigation is to understand, does this hang on or does it go away? I've been talking about the bow swinging down and breaking off for 20 years, but I never had any proof. It's just outside of science at this point. And I thought, well, we'll just build a model and break it. I, I have no way of saying that that is in fact what happened, but I'd like to be able to rule it in as a possibility because then I don't have to remake the frickin' film. <laughs> We're gonna be doing practical rigging with pyrotechnics and sinking it in a tank. I immediately thought of Gene Warren. I've known him forever. We've done a few projects together over the years. Let's think about what would be the best way to help hold that up when this breaks. He wanted us to do a disaster forensics on really what happened when Titanic sank. Because water is water. Water doesn't change its dynamics. Let's see what the bow does, let's see what the stern does, and recreate what might have happened. I've been wanting to do this damn model test for a long time. I knew that trying to incorporate all the lessons we'd learned about the sinking into a single model test wouldn't be easy. Well, that's not what I believe happened. But I was about to find out just how hard it would be. You're not following what I'm saying. Iceberg, right ahead! For over 20 years, I've wondered why Titanic went down the way it did movie it breaks and the stern falls back with a big wave and then the bow pulls it down and its stern stands up straight and then the bow breaks off sinks straight down and that stern sitting there and it slowly goes down it's a dramatic image and as accurate as I could make it at the time but I've never stopped trying to find out exactly what happened over the years our little analysis team has used a wide variety of source material in order to try and put together the pieces of the puzzle that is the sinking of the titanic we know from the wreck exactly where the steel broke right to the rivet jim's exploration of the bow section has fine-tuned our understanding of what was going on during the flooding and during the descent of the ocean floor we got a mast that's knocked aft all of the b deck forward facing windows Broken, broken, broken. To me, that all adds up to 
a very strong longitudinal flow over the ship. We see a consistent pattern of the effects of an almost hurricane-like flow of water from the front of the ship toward the back of the ship. That can only be explained by the ship sinking vertically straight down. Big piece of the keel, 70 feet long, two big frames of the double bottom were found way out in the debris field. They had been ripped off the ship by what? Well, they'd been ripped off by the bow, separating. Bit by bit, putting all these little data points together, we're essentially able to reverse engineer major keyframes of the sinking. We engaged the United States Navy to build two computer simulation models of Titanic. One showed us how the water progressed through the ship as it sank. The other measures the stresses in a hull. And what it told us was Titanic didn't need to rise 90 degrees out of the water. The model calculated approximately 23 degrees before the peak stresses were realized in the structure and she broke. But for a ship the size of Titanic to sink, there's an unlimited number of variables going on during the sinking. The computer simulation would bear some of that out, but too many variables to nail down exactly what would happen. So we got to try a different dimension, and that's where the physical model comes in. Hydrodynamically, it's yeah. got to be pretty close to what the ship was, I think. It's a one-off model. It's not 100% accurate in some of its fine details, but it was accurate in terms of the overall shape, which is all we really need for a hydrodynamic study. The biggest part was having this model float and then sink, like we learned from all of our research gathering. It's a known length, right? 70 feet. Yes. 70 feet from the, from from the, the break, break point out. here. We knew that the model was going to have to break, so we had to put in a mechanism that would allow it to break at the point where our computer simulation had indicated. And so this is the hinge piece down here? The yep. hinge is right here. Right no, inside. that's not what I'm calling the hinge piece. The hinge isn't here. The hinge is here. Jim, he'd given us some direction. Um, we kind of got it half right, but he wanted the hinge in a different place. It's what I call the banana theory which is as the ship broke, that keel, the strongest part of the ship, held on. This falls back, and that's there, and then it rips away. Mm -hmm. That's and there's exactly. your hinge piece. And as it ripped away, it formed almost like a third piece. The keel, it goes right. like that. No, it doesn't take off yet, necessarily, necessarily. That's what we want to understand. Right. It's a kind of a proof of concept. We can never prove what actually happened. We can only prove what might have happened. The hydrodynamic forces on this were enough to snap the mast out, mm -hmm. blow the wheelhouse off. Mm -hmm. Jim came in and looked at it, and what he did not see is the water flow that accounts for a lot of the damage that we've seen at the wreck. So he's directed some changes so that we can truly remove any latent buoyancy left in the bow. We didn't have all the interior walls and everything that would have slowed down the rate of flooding. So we used a combination of sponges and foam. Foam to provide buoyancy, sponges to provide a delaying factor in how quickly a space will fill up with water once flooding. It's all very catastrophic right in here and very fast, which is the equivalent of this, wicking the water in rapidly. Each successive run, was basically a fine-tuning of the model to where we would see it perform the way that we knew it had to. And we sunk this damn ship yet? Believe it or not, we're doing exactly, we're doing the banana peel. Okay, well, let's see what we got. That thing's buoyant, so that's no good. It needs to be negative. Then we came up with another problem. When the ship breaks, it loses buoyancy. Our buoyancy was foam. We couldn't just make it disappear when it broke, so we had to come up with a method to have the foam work its own way out of the hull to simulate the loss of buoyancy after the break. If they tried to adjust flotation in this so that the break happened where it's always been filmed, it's too high out of the water. It oh, yeah, 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 we definitely got that wrong. At yeah. that point, it became a team effort. I would drill up this area, right? Yeah. This should all be packed with sponge. He jumped in with us like we were at Roger Corman days, like he was in his 20s again. So we'll probably have to cut these up, right? There we were, back rigging stuff together and doing tape and soldering and all the things that you do. That wasn't setting the Wayback Machine for 20 years ago on Titanic. That was setting it back to the early 80s for me. You've done this before. Well, a few times. <laughs> I'm blowing my share of shit up. I tried to figure out how to do it in a way that we fine tune the breakup. By changing that timing, we could have the stern fall back more or fall back less, have the bow swing down more or swing down less. 
when we did our computer simulation, there was a moment where the stresses on the ship exceeded the strength of the material. And that's when it should have broken. And that happened when the ship tilted to 23 degrees. So when we sank the ship at 23 degrees, it seemed to do everything that was observed. We said it broke at 23 degrees, so we were actually breaking at around 25, 26 degrees, according to this crude test. But I mean, I think, you know, it's telling us something. We're homing in on this. And in fact, that was even increased when it broke. The stern kind of popped up a little bit, and you could kind of see the break. And the bow swung down and detached and fell vertically. So we feel pretty comfortable that, that it was somewhere between maybe 20 and 30 degrees of tilt when it broke. All right, here we go. Let's do it. Let's roll. All right, so drops are clear. And breaks right at the water line. Oh, that's Comes sweet. up a little bit. Sweet. Swings down, pulls the stern it's more vertical. That's the banana model. Check that out. <laughs> Touchdown! We did see some scenarios played out. Almost exactly it was filmed. The stern going under vertically, giving Jack and Rose their few moments right there at the fan tail. As the stern came up and went vertical, it always turned almost 90 degrees. And that's exactly what people saw. Now people describe it standing up like a, like a tower or like a finger pointing at the sky. And that's exactly what we saw. Yes! Vertical stern! Yes! It's not like we did a battery of 100 runs with a very precision model. But I think it does show what is possible to have happened. I think what we're seeing is there's a range, right? You can get it to where the stern falls back but then it doesn't go vertical when it goes under. When well, we found it, you can have the stern sink vertically and you can have the stern fall back with a big splash, but you can't have both. So the film is wrong on one point or the other. I tend to think it's wrong on the fallback of the stern because of what we see at the bow of the wreck. There are about five or six instances of hydrodynamic effects and there's only one way that can happen. It swung down and it shot off like a bomb dropping straight down. So I think we can rule in the possibility of a vertical stern sinking. And I think we can rule out the possibility of it both falling back and then going vertical. We were sort of half right in the movie. With each thing that we try, each step that we take, I think we're getting closer and closer to what actually did happen that night. OK, let's do it again. That was perfect. Yeah, exactly. Let's do it again. <laughs> I'm constantly fascinated by the engineering, the hardware, the forensics, and I'll get very excited about the ideas, you know. You always have to kind of grab yourself by the scruff of your neck and remind yourself what happened there was a real tragedy that happened to real people, and it, and it still resonates down through time in this very powerful way. And sometimes you forget that in the moment, but I try never to forget it for very long. Our scale model sinking took only seconds. In real life, the passengers and crew had about an hour and a half to escape. More than two-thirds of them didn't make it. Which brings up another controversy. Could more people have been saved? Mr. Andrews, forgive me. I did the sum in my head. And with the number of lifeboats times the capacity you mentioned, forgive me, but it seems that there are not enough for everyone aboard. About half, actually. Titanic carried 20 lifeboats, but they only managed to launch 18 in an hour and a half. Now, we've all been told that if the ship carried more boats, more lives could have been saved. But would that really have made a difference? Could the crew have launched more boats in the time they had? I've wondered about this for a long time, and we never tested it until now. So what we did was we took a replica lifeboat left over from the movie with a set of davits mounted atop a platform that was tall enough to represent the height of the promenade deck, boat deck being up on top. Got a crew to man and lower the lifeboat so that we could see how long it took. We figured that it would take about two minutes to roll the canvas back on these lifeboats. Roll back that cover! Roll back that cover! So we preset our clock to two minutes. OK, so the ropes are in. And you guys know what to do, right, to get them flaked out on the deck? Mm -hmm. You're going to do that sort of there and there, yeah. so we need to stay out of those? No, I think we can put it right there. Well, put it where you would have done it if you were really on the ship. OK. And if we're in your way, then move us out of the way, because we're curious passengers. 
and you're having to yell at us to get out of the way politely, of course, because we're also, you know, <laughs> yeah. rich passengers in the first and class of noisy. the area of Titanic. So when we say go, ready the boat, and then tell us when it's ready. Okay. Yeah. Bring lines on deck. Clock is running. Remove cradle. Swing boat out. Yeah, you can see how geared down it is on that lead screw. It takes a lot of cranks to get that data uh -huh. to move just a few feet. Keel cleared. Keep cranking. Yeah, the other thing you notice is, was the voice commands by the officer coordinating the two sides. And yeah. in the beginning, with that steam going off, they're going to have trouble hearing. Somebody yeah. would have to yell back and forth, or somebody would just have to see the other guys working yeah. and just imitate, because they couldn't hear anything. OK, good. Lower boat to embarkation deck. So at one point, do they start loading? It? So they're going to lower it down to the edge of the boat deck. Because yeah. then you just step into it. Right, you want to step yeah. into it. You do not want them stepping over if you can avoid right. it. Hold it. Secure the boat. OK. I stop stop the clock. Eight minutes and 30 seconds. seconds. Eight wow. minutes and 30 seconds. Now, we're going to have to just estimate the loading time. The key here is, is that you don't know how much time you have. You've never practiced this. But just as a baseline, let's get some values for how long it takes to do each part of the operation. Yeah, exactly. So I think you're, you're probably looking at a, a time that varied. Well, Initially, it was probably slower as people were reticent. And then later, as they got more desperate, it probably sped up. Let's say 10 minutes. Okay. Let's say 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, that puts us up to 18 and a half minutes. Now, let's see how long it takes us to lower one deck level. V and clock running. Ready. Okay, lower. You're right. It, it jerks its way down. And look at the You can see how jerky it is even now, not loaded. It'd be like three times that when it was fully loaded. That'd make it a lot harder to lower. Okay, hold it. Okay, stopping the clock. So what was that? Just shy yeah. of two minutes. Just shy of two minutes. Okay, so that's two minutes to go 10 feet. Mm -hmm. It's another 50 feet to the water. So we have to add another 10 minutes. So that's 30 minutes, 30 seconds. And they were working simultaneously. They were loading passengers in while they were cranking out the next boat. Right. Then our times can telescope right. somewhat. When you start multiplying it out, it should have taken more like two hours. From the time the lifeboats were ordered to launch, you had about an hour and a half. However they managed it, they had just enough time to get those boats Not away. quite enough time. Yeah, not quite. The I'll... truth is the last two boats, right. the last two collapsibles were washed off the ship. They did not have time. It's actually pretty amazing that they managed to launch as many lifeboats as they did. And what made it even more challenging was that in the final stages of Titanic sinking, the lifeboats were being launched right on top of each other. To avoid being crushed, men were cutting the ropes connected to the davits with pocket knives. I mean, I wanted to see for myself how difficult that was. Let's raise up one end of the boat in contact. About one inch out of the cradle, and then they want to cut one off the ropes. Okay. No, I was thinking more like a foot. Let's do an foot. action shot. Let's raise it up a foot, guys. All right, so who's going to do the honors? What, somebody I'll do has to go into sure, the boat? Right. I'll do it. Whatever happens, Jim, we'll get it on film. Exactly. Let's go. Clock running. All right. Jeez. Is this an actual knife? It, it should have been a really sharp knife. And it's sharp. But we do know this type of knife was used. All right, I'm going to go with your expertise. I think I probably would cut faster if my life depended on it. That's promising. So we're getting close. Oh, jeez. You imagine like 50 people screaming? Yeah. Water well, coming the, up. There's a boat coming down in your head, don't forget. Yeah, that too. That's gonna get dramatic here in a second. You can hear it. All right, that's promising. <sighs> Beauty. Now we're free. Yeah. So how long did that take? 140. I would say <laughs> yeah. if my life depended on it, I could probably yeah. shave about 30 seconds off that. And you go for a ride.
I think if you had more lifeboats on that ship, they would have just gotten in the way, and it might have cost hundreds of lives. At Cherbourg, a woman came aboard named Margaret Brown, but we all called her Molly. History would call her the unseekable Molly Brown. Well, I wasn't about to wait all day for you, Sonny. Yes. Here, you think you can manage? Yes. Margaret Brown was one of the most famous survivors of the Titanic. Her warmth and strength after the disaster became part of the legend. Margaret Brown, Molly Brown, as the world knows her, uh, was obviously quite a character. She sounded like a real pistol. I would have loved to have met her. Seems like you've got a little bit of her, her gene of vivaciousness. Oh, that's nice of you to say. She was intelligent. She had like that emotional intelligence to read the situations, yeah. and I, I really like that. The fact that she was in boat six with the, with the guy that was at the helm when they hit the iceberg, mm -hmm. the guy that was in the crow's mm -hmm. nest who should have spotted the iceberg maybe a little bit sooner, and then the helmsman, Hitchens, he refused to go back mm -hmm. and got into a real tussle with her. There's plenty of room for more. And there'll be one less on this boat if you don't shut that hole in your face. I like to say that my great-grandmother's story starts where your movie left off, because uh, wow. later in the night, she actually took over that boat, right. actually using the same threat that Hitchens had used on her, yeah. that if you interfere with us doing what I think we need to do right now, I'm gonna throw you overboard. You don't understand. If we go back, they'll swamp the boat. They'll pull us right down, I'm telling you. Knock it off. You're scaring me. And they told me that he had said during his lifetime, Mrs. Brown could have gotten into any boat that night. Why, Why did, did she, she have to in step mine? in mine? <laughs> well, she was very confronting with him. He was at the helm when the ship hit an iceberg. So now I've learned a little bit more about my ancestor, but is there anything that you would really like to have changed now that this much time has gone by or based on reaction from the movie or? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think that meeting people such as yourselves who are connected, whose mm -hmm. families are connected to the event really made me appreciate something that I don't think I quite realized when I was making the film. Yes, I knew it was history, but I wasn't as sensitive to the families, I don't think, the descendants, and how that story meant so much to them. And in the case of First Officer William McMaster Murdoch, I took the liberty of showing him shoot somebody and then shoot himself. He's a named character. He wasn't a generic mm -hmm. officer. We don't know that he did that. But you know, the storyteller in me says, oh, I start connecting the dots. He was on duty, he's carrying all this burden with him, made him an interesting character, but I was being a screenwriter. I wasn't thinking about being a historian. And I think I wasn't as sensitive about the fact that his family, his survivors, might feel offended by that, and they were. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I, I feel like I should have made him more of a generic character then, and just then it could have been any one of a mm -hmm. number of people who were at that place at that time. What was that, Mr. Murdoch? An iceberg, sir. When we would go out on an expedition, we'd wait till 1140 at night, which was the moment the ship hit the iceberg, right at that exact spot, and we'd go out onto the bow of the research ship and we'd raise a glass in honor of the passengers and the crew of the RMS Titanic. And so I would just like to propose a toast to you, the descendants and the representatives of that history. And thank you for sharing it with us. So to your ancestors, these are people that have grown up with Titanic in their family and it's kind of always looming over them and it, and it means something to them and it, in some ways it's defined them to an entire global community of titanic enthusiasts and historians these people are passing on the torch of what their family knows to make me count 
Jim Cameron's Titanic was beyond anybody's expectations. We knew when we were working on it, it was going to be epic. What a great setting for a love story. This fantastic shipwreck that has fascinated people for decades anyway, presented so vividly and so accurately. To go back there is to risk being pulled down into that icy water with them. So it's really a choice between your lives and their lives. James Cameron brought Titanic back to life, as I have tried to do through my entire life with my paintings. And you can't put enough value on that. I knew the old lady in her grave. That's the Titanic I knew. Jim showed me this beautiful young woman. We sailors tend to think of ships as women. He showed me that beautiful ship. Well, I just loved it. That movie used Titanic as a stage to tell a teenage love story. It wasn't meant to be a historical narrative, but it created a passion in Jim to follow up that movie with actual expeditions to the actual wreck. And because of that continued interest that goes way beyond a feature film, we have made discoveries and learned things that have actually changed the history and our understanding of Titanic. I just really was fascinated by Titanic, the story, the, the archaeology of it, and just wanted to know more what happened that night in terms of the final moments of the ship and the breakup, the way it sank. We will never know exactly what happened, but we can say what is possible to have happened. Titanic wasn't just a story. This was something real. This really happened to real people. And we need to honor those that died and their families. I think it's important for filmmakers to, to understand that responsibility and actually get it right.